Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hit and Hustle from irissportsdaily.com. I am your host, Greg Flamong, and with me, as always, is Jamie Uyama, Mr. Jamie University. I really like that, that sweatshirt, Jamie. That's, that's, I like that. Oh, that's thank nice. you. It looks good, man. It, it matches the, the, the what you got, San, San Francisco on the hat yep. there? That's wonderful. It, it matches very nicely. So good job by you on that. It is April 16th, Tuesday. Uh, Jamie is back from South Bend. How long are you in South Bend? Like, was it 10 days, something like that? It was too uh, long, too long. It was like, almost two weeks. Uh, was like, it was like about like 11 days. 11 days. All right. So, so Jamie's back. He's got the intel. Uh, he's got his observations. He was able to see the Jersey scrimmage, the, the, the famous Jersey scrimmage that everyone's talking about. Uh, he was there for that. So we're going to talk to him about that. Uh, some kind of big picture stuff, some of the things he saw. We're going to add some context to the conversation because uh, I've, I've been taking it in. Oh, Chris Wojak is here. Thank you for being here, Chris. It has been a little bit. Uh, thank you for, for being a part of this. CFB Hertz is here. Rajon is here. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to add some context to the conversation. I, I feel like a lot of people are talking about the same subjects and making some conclusions a little bit. And uh, I, I want to kind of drill down on what actually is going on there. So that's that's going to be the focus of today's show. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you like what you see today and you like what you hear, please hit the like button on this video. Please subscribe to our channel. Please hit the notification bell so you know ever is. We are going live. Links to the podcast are going to be in the description below. And as always, we could not do this without... Mm -hmm. Our, our long-standing sponsor, ESQ Clothing, founded by Notre Dame alum Ga Wang. You've seen ESQ on all your favorite Notre Dame players and coaches with over a decade of making the best, cust the best clothing available, custom clothing available. ESQ will help you look and feel your best in 2024 from a perfect fitting suit or sport coat shirt or bomber jacket or the perfect tuxedo for wedding season. Check out Ga's amazing work at esqclothing.com. Book an appointment to upgrade your wardrobe today. Mention ISD and get 10% off your entire purchase. Uh, the transfer portal opened up today, Jamie. Uh, so far, no movement, you know, that we've seen. I, we saw that Clarence Lewis uh, is into the port or is uh, he committed to play for Syracuse, Jamie. So uh, Clarence Lewis is, is going to be a Syracuse Orangeman. A uh, good opportunity for him. He's probably going to get a ton of snaps over there, something that he would not get uh, at Notre Dame. He, might, he would have got a good amount of snaps at Notre Dame, but maybe not, you know, obviously not as many. Uh, there's been some really good reports about Jordan Clark as well. So that probably, you know, played in his decision to go. Um, I would say, I, I, I would say the, the kind of the biggest thing that came out of it that I read, Jamie, is, um, you know, from you. Listen, you and Mike talk about Power Hour. Uh, CJ Carr, he's uh, he's acquitting himself very nicely at Notre Dame. Uh, tell us what you saw from him in the game, and then we'll talk about the quarterback position kind of overall. Or not the game, the scrimmage, excuse me. Yeah, he – I mean, obviously he played very well. Um, you know, did uh, – handle himself really well. Just thought, like, you know, he made a couple, like, big, big-time throws uh, – um, two ones in specifically, uh, just on, on skinny post to Cam Williams for a touchdown. And then, um, there was another one to Jack Polian later on. So obviously he wasn't like working with, um, you know, he's working with threes for the most part, yeah. uh, you know, but, uh, and, and against twos and threes for, 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 for the most part. So, you know, he takes some of that into account, but he played really well. And I think, to me, all it was was just like a continuation of the guy he showed he was as a prospect. Mm -hmm. I think he – I think one thing that has stood out to me about C.J. Carr throughout this whole thing because, you know, obviously I remember when he was like the hyped-up guy that's like, man, uh, Notre Dame has like, oh, we, we got to land C.J. Carr. They, they all really wanted C.J. Carr. And then you commit early, and even though he's helping build the class – people kind of forget about it because he was still like a top 50 guy, but he didn't rise up to be a five star. Mm -hmm. But I think people forget that like Tyler Buckner and uh, Phil Dracovic were very highly uh, ranked guys who dipped later on, right? Yeah. They dipped later on. And frankly, they were like bad 
at at elite 11 events and stuff and that's why they kind of went um you know uh you know that's that's the the why those guys heading into it weren't kind kind of like even though they were seen as like potential like saviors they could be this guy it wasn't like a surprise when those guys like struggled a bit to start and i think you've seen um like you said Carr has acquitted himself really, really well at, at the beginning. And um, I think it just shows like, you know, while it's a long way to go from being like, oh, he's the guy, um, he has a chance to be great. And I think that's what people should take away from it. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of where it is for me. Just it, it I, I don't know what it means for 2024, if anything. Most likely it doesn't mean much. 2024 just generally speaking it's usually gonna that's gonna how it's gonna be he's got older players in front of him he's got riley leonard in front of him as well i think the fact that he is so impressive just throwing the ball right now that just kind of shows you like they've really got something here and and that's the case for like a couple guys too like even the cam williams thing right and I understand the the caveats that everyone kind of points out because it matters in the big picture for for the 2024 season. Like it, it it's not against the starters, right? So it, it's 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 that to say there's levels to this. You you do have to you do have to do it in one place first, and then you do it up against the twos, and then you do it up against the ones. You actually you know you actually like you have to do it every play, and it has to yeah. be a high level every single play. But like. You should go out there against the threes. If you're against the threes, you should do that against them. Yeah. Right. Same thing for Cam Williams. It's a process. I thought that's, yeah. The throw that he made. And first of all, the the edit that the ed, and Andy FIM put out. What a great job they did on that on that uh, that production. <laughs> that that was some great uh, editing job. The, some of the clips that they got were fantastic. And the way they got the the kind of the field view of his pass to uh, to Cam Williams, like that just shows the ball is spinning. Like the ball comes out and it is spinning very nicely, gets it over over the uh, either the linebacker or whatever position. I think that was uh, he threw it over top of Jaden Osbury. Don't know what position specifically he was playing, whether it was linebacker or rover for that Aztec position, whatever it was. But he fits it over there. And then, but he has enough zip on it to also like get the ball in there because he's got to get it in before the end zone. You can see like Cam Williams kind of catches it in the middle of the end zone and then he's in the back of the end zone. So he zips it in there, also gets it over the linebacker, gets it down in time to get the touchdown. It, it, and the thing landed soft too, which is like, that's the thing with every great quarterback is they they somehow zip the ball, but it comes in like easily catchable. All the great quarterbacks have that. And and so that just like you see that stuff, you know, you, you see on the highlight clip, he's 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 telling a guy like, hey, come here, like come back to me. And then he hits, I think that was Cam Williams again on the sideline, like directing traffic in the game and then throwing the strike. It, it's just good stuff. And and you love to see that, right? And you love to see that, like, hey, this guy is, um, he's a dude. He's real. Right. And so, look, and, and it's great to have a, a highly rated quarterback who who doesn't have some quirky throwing motion, who doesn't have, you know, it's like, oh, man, like that doesn't look good coming out of his hand. Like, that's not the problem with CJ Carr. It's really nice to have that as well. Um, you mentioned Kenny Minchie, though. You said you mentioned in the in the scrimmage, Kenny Minchie did a good job. Uh, and there were some interceptions in this game. Steve Angeli uh, threw a couple picks. And uh, and and uh, I think Kenny Minchie threw a pick as well. And you mentioned that these come off of automatic checks. Yeah. And to give context, well, the two pick sixes, the two pick sixes did. Yeah. The two pick sixes came off automatic checks. So, so some context here. In the spring, even in summer, to some extent, you're running all your stuff. And the defense is going against all your stuff. They know all your checks. They know. They know Halfway everything. Through spring, they know everything. And and the thing is, is like they know if we run this defense, they have to make this check. So this is where I'm going to go, right? That won't be like that in a game. 
so these aren't bad reads. The quarterback is essentially either he makes a throw or he eat it. And look, maybe he could eat it, right? Maybe you could throw it in the dirt. Or you try to force it in there in a practice. Like, I don't have a problem with that, okay? You throw pick sixes, I'm not, I'm not freaked out about it, okay? Like, it's just, it's not a thing that happens. Uh, but talk about, you know, what you saw from Kenny Minchie. You said you said you were, you were impressed by him. What did you see from Kenny Minchie that kind of made you feel that way? Yeah, Kenny Minchie looked good, too. And this is always why, too, right? Which is I don't want people to just, like, over – because, I, I, you know, I, I saw, like, everybody was just like, oh, CJ Carr was so great. It's like, well, and this is why, too, it's worth it mentioning that, um, you know, he was going against the twos and threes uh, because Minchie faced more of the ones. You know, like the two offense had to go against the ones like a decent amount. And he also got to work in with the one offense, too. So and and Jelly was always working with the starters, too. So it's like reps wise, those guys are ahead of Carr. So, so for people to be like, ah, you know, Carr did this in the scrimmage. Well, those guys are out. It's like, no, nah, it doesn't work like that. And it's also not one of those things where it's like how they they're giving out the reps wouldn't make would it would be stupid for those guys to be like that and be like, man, this guy lit up the threes. I'm out. Like, no, like that's not how it works. And that would be just dumb. And people need to chill and not overreact to, to all the kind of stuff. And I get it because people get hyped up about it, but don't get too hyped about it because it's not like the other guys were bad or anything right. like that. And I thought CJ Carp or uh, Minchie was pretty good uh, in the thing. So, you know, you mentioned the pick six, that was the one where X Watts was in a hundred percent. I, I, I guarantee you, he knew that call as soon as whatever they checked into it, he knew this was coming because he sat on it. He yeah. sat, he sat on it and you could see him like waiting and just like, you know, and should, you know, Minchie maybe have recognized that before. Sure. Whatever. Right. But it's just one of those things where it's like an auto auto check, whatever you think it's going to be there. Well, it wasn't right. So, um, but earlier on that drive, and actually, I think it might have been like the play before the right, the the, the play, or maybe the second play before that, or something like that. Um, he did a great job where you know he checked into a protection, got moved the back, you know, was 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 changing the play, and then they had a, a blitz called. O line did a great job picking it up, and guess what? There was like you know, a hole you could drive a truck through that he just ran and he took like, he got like a 30 yard game mm. on, on a scramble. And it wasn't like he just ran for like, you could see he like made guys miss. He is a heck of an athlete. He looked great as a runner. He had, a, he had a great couple of escapes um, from pressure too, which is something CJ Carr did a, as well. Right. Which you love. Like, so I like the way that he handled himself in the pocket, you know, him kind of like going and like taking ownership and like changing a protection, getting a, like that kind of stuff is big because that's the kind of stuff that um, I think like, you know, you're only looking for uh, this great throw here or this or this right thing. But if you can't run the offense, you can't actually run the offense and get into the right play that you need to. You can't play quarterback on a game day. You can't. Right. right. So that's the kind of thing that um, was really big. And, he, you know, he made some good throws too. Like, um definitely just like one of these things where accuracy I think has always stuck out with me with him too, is like, he puts it on guys, right? Yeah. He, he really, really puts it on guys. And I would say over the accuracy from um, the group in general, like that was, that's something that really stood out from the three, all three of them is like mm -hmm. these guys, when it was tight coverage, they put it where it needed to be. And if, it got broken up or something like that. It was a great play. Like it was a great play and it was because the coverage was so good or whatever. And then when they put it on guys, when there was room, like they gave guys chances to get after the catch. Like they weren't putting it on some guy's back hip when they're running on a crosser. It was like giving them a chance to kind of make a play after. And I think that really uh, stood out from like Minchie and I would say from and jelly too. Yeah. So it, it, look, if, if you have a high level room, right, you're going to see a lot of good things from a lot of players. Right. And and I think the, the the kind of the overarching part of that is they're all learning to run the offense. Right. Because I think that for the offense this spring, vis-a-vis -vis the defense is like 
Like, cause everyone's talking about how the offense, you know, the defense dominated the scrimmage or whatever it may be. And yeah, like the, the, it's a new offensive coordinator and none of these got like Steve Angeli is the only one who, uh, you know, got a meaningful snaps last year. Right. But they're working in all these other guys. Like, they lost Joe Walt and Blake Fisher. Like, they lost Audrick Estime, right? Like, these are your top guys. Like, Mitchell Evans isn't playing in the spring. Like, Jake, Jaden Thomas isn't bad. So, my point is, is that when you knew have a new offensive coordinator and you're replacing all these top players, they don't know how to go down and score, like, mean, like in drives in a scrimmage against a defense this good. Like, imagine if the if it was flipped. And you had a third year of Mike Denbrock. You returned most of your key guys. And then you had a new defensive coordinator who's putting in something completely different. And you had to replace some other players. Like, they might have some good plays, right? The defense might have some good plays. But the offense is going to move the ball up and down the field. Because they know how to go and score. This offense doesn't know how to go and score. And this defense does know how to stop people from scoring. They did it against everyone last year, right? They're a very good defense. Like, we talk about them all the time. This could be a great, great defense. So I'm not worried about the fact that, like, the defense is is dominating or whatever. It's like you want to hear about the, the, the things that they can do. Like, hey, they show good accuracy, right? They, like, Jaden Greathouse showed that he can get open and be a playmaker, Right, Cam Williams showed he could be able, get open, be a playmaker. Chris Mitchell showed he can do some things, uh, especially after the catch. Right, so like it's the little plays that stick out that make you say, okay, like this is something that the offense can work with, right? Uh, but I do want to hone in on the offensive line because that was another one where I think people were concerned. There were a lot of sacks for the defense, um, and so I wanted to get some context from you on this because I'm having a hard time kind of deciding how I want to feel about this because if if they're turning a bunch of guys loose, right? Notre Dame's sending pressure and they're they're turning people loose, whether it's uh whether it's a nickel or a linebacker or they're picking up a nickel linebacker and a defensive end comes free or whatever it may be, then those are mental errors as well as physical errors. And the offensive line needs time to gel. Okay. That's a lot easier to correct than hey our tackles are just getting whooped in one-on-one situations. So I'm kind of, I kind of want to hear where you come out on that. What, what was the, what was the context around that stuff? I mean, there were some plays, uh, some blitzes where they did guys did get turned loose. Mm. Um, but some of that was because of like, you know, the blitz they ran and how many guys and they overloaded one side right. or whatever it wasn't. I, I don't think it was like mental errors where it was like, Oh, some guys just come straight up the middle um unblocked or whatever mm. right so and i thought really the backs did a good job in, in in pass pro for the most part in in the game um but I, and i would say too some of those times where those guys were turned loose i think some of those you know and you always hear it like this is on the quarterback like yeah you know the ball's got to get out and yeah. and that and that's one thing too what i'll say is that like especially with minchie and um car like they would have got lit up like so i mean this is also too why i want to tamper the hype down for both those guys too because they would have taken some monster shots in this game it, you know they were able to kind of be like okay i can like step up and like do some things here but it was like nah you're getting murdered here like it's just and, and it's kind of on them to get rid of the ball too right and that's something that as a veteran, you're knowing like, okay, I'm live to play another down right now. Like I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. Sometimes you got to know that. And so I think there's that part with those guys that I think kind of has to be learned. And it, that's hard to learn in a camp setting, uh, whether it's spring ball or fall camp, because, um, you know, you're not getting hit and you're not live. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, the O line, for the most part, I, I thought did a pretty good job, like picking up stuff, like in terms of like some of the stunts and blitzes. There, there were some stunts where where guys got through, and so there was a couple of of, of that kind of thing um, that I noticed. Uh, you know, 
where they did give up some stuff there. But I mean, frankly, the tackles just got beat too much. They did. They they got beat too much. Just like one on one, straight one on one, just straight up, just okay. got straight up beat around the beat around the corner, right? Like who? Oh, wait, was, you say the tackles? The tackles, okay. all of them. So I'm talking all of them. I'm talking about Charles Jagusaw too in there because I think you know I'm not saying that uh, it, you know he didn't look fine for the most part or whatever, but it was like. I'm not going to let's not pretend that he, he, you know, he was out there looking like Joe Alt. He wasn't, right. you know, like he, he was, he was not like, um, and he got beat, uh, as well, not as much as some of the other guys, right? You know, and, and, and obviously it's different when there's like when Ty Chan is out there on the third team getting beat as a tackle, that's a bit different than, um, you know, some of the other guys. But, you know, Wagner got beat around the edge. Uh, you know, Baker got beat a lot. He got beat a lot. And, um, you know, certainly Sullivan Absher too, right? So that is something that, like, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's concerning. It's concerning. It, it, as much as you think, like, I do think Notre Dame has some really, really, like, explosive – talented edge rushers this year and i think they are going to be better rushing off the edge like you you can tell a difference with botello he, he is yeah lighter more explosive more of the guy that you kind of uh he was the previous at the back end of the previous season of, of 2022 uh-huh. season and certainly like i mean bubakar Treor looked fantastic and he's a guy too who can win in so many different ways and his snap anticipation is fantastic and then Sneed too was like explosive off the edge, and KBA looked had some good rushes, and and you know even you could go open, you know he can be a problem too. They've got and I mean I'll say that uh, you know even um, you know uh, Burnham and, and Tui Halamaka had some had some nice flashes too as fast rushers. So, but you know there isn't that level where sometimes it's just like no one should win around the edge there that easy. Yeah. And it, and it happened, it happened a bit too frequently. Right. So um, that's something that, you know, is going to be, you know, that can change how you have to block <laughs> each week. It's like, well, well now we're going to have to chip here to get yeah. this guy help. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. And if you're doing that, then, you know, you're taking out a guy like a JD Price or whoever out of you know running a route or Jeremiah Love from out running a route or something like that, right? So that's not a good thing, right? And Payne can catch the ball and do some things too. So there's all of that. So I think you know that is something that um you know you'll see when they're get getting to play. Uh, when, by the time there's still a long way to go until Texas A&M, but Texas A&M, they got some very, very good edge rushers. And that's going to be something that, I mean, hundred percent when you're looking at it uh, g- going into that game, like that is going to be a matchup. Like that is going to be a matchup. And so if you get into a situation where Notre Dame has to throw the ball to win the game, it's something to think about. So um where where are they at in in fall like certainly i think that like that right tackle job is still going to be open if there was someone to come in the portal that they could beat there i'm sure they would pick them up i don't know if there will be but I, i'm sure that i'm sure they would uh take a look at it so um i don't want to say like uh people should just be like man this is like it, it's not like freak out uh that people should absolutely f- freak out about it you know i saw cfb hurt said like old line stock down it's really stock hold right because that's the kind of what you thought about it kind of going into it is like i'm uncertain about this right tackle job and it's just remains that right and i think and then you could look at other things where you're like okay this is positive like in terms of them like i thought running the football just in terms of just the movement up front some of the combo block stuff like you know and obviously it's first look i'm not going back and watching the film we can't watch the film that but but i thought that part of it looked pretty good. And like I said, a lot of like the blitz pickup stuff was, was pretty good for the most part. Um, so um, I don't know. I'd say the jury's out, right? The jury's out. The jury was always going to be out. Um, 
So Carberry Q is making a point. This is the best defense the offense is going to play um, all regular season. That is true. That that is true. Okay. Um, he's also mentioning uh, a pass happy scrimmage, and they said the run blocking was decent when they did run. Pass blocking takes some time to gel. So look, who's they? I don't know. I, I think I think that. It's a the point is it's a pass happy scrimmage, and so if especially if the defense knows that like they're gonna pin their ears back right. So these are all point taken context. That's why I kind of want to get more context about it. Here's the thing. I'll say they're also very vanilla on offense for sure. For sure. Here here's the thing. Okay, it, it, you you report on what you see. They're getting beat too much. Okay, just, just straight up. Like that's the that's the takeaway. Lots of caveats, lots of context. You you they also have the opportunity to just do a better job, right? That that's also a, a thing that they could just do. And they didn't, and that's fine. Uh it is what it is. It's a spring practice, it's one practice, and they have a ton of time. Okay. Um you mentioned a and has got some edge rushers, man. And and the, lots of teams. Like any good team is going to have good edge rushers. Okay? Louisville is going to be a problem. Yeah. Louisville is going to be a problem. Like these teams, Brubacar Traore, Jordan Patelho, Oban, they're, they're good. Notre Dame's got some dudes. But I feel like a lot of teams kind of have some dudes that can rush the passer. It's very important in college football. It's a major point of emphasis for every program. It's something they got to figure out. Um, uh, CFB Hertz says the tackle situation. It, it, the, I think the, ju- the the crux of this question is how are we feeling about Joe Rudolph? Are, how much confidence do you have? Maybe not specifically in Joe Rudolph per se, but just like how much confidence are, are you just based on what you've seen, based on what you've heard? It's like, hey, so at times it doesn't look good, but at times it looks okay. And I think they'll get it figured out by the time it's it's time to put the pads on and actually do some stuff that matters. Or are you like, man, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, it, it's a little bit more hope than confidence, I guess. Where, where do you come out on that? I mean, Tosh Baker played for, you know, three different coaches and he didn't look like a stud for any of them. So I don't know how that's Joe Rudolph. You know what I mean? Like, I understand he's like later on with Joe Rudolph now, but like, it's not like he went from like, man, Tosh Baker really just didn't develop like we thought he would because of this. Cause we had heard he was going to be this. It was like, no, like he has never really kind of shown um, that, you know, no one was ever hyping him up to the point where like a, like a Fisher or an alt, you know? Yeah. So that wasn't, that hasn't happened since he's been on campus. Right. So um, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I just think that like, um, I, I think overall, like they just didn't recruit well enough at tackle, um, or, you know, just over that course of that time, like where they took like guys where you, where you're looking at, like, I think a lot of people could have said like right away, like Andrew Christophic, uh, who was seen as some um, as like a future left tackle was like, well, he's got really short arms and he's got to like add weight, but he doesn't have like the kind of body that was like look like it was going to be easy for him to carry weight. And it's like, I mean, that was going to be, it's going to be tough thing. And he was a guy who was considered a tackle. Well, he was like a guard right away, right? Like he was an interior guy right away. And they just like a lot of classes where, you know, who are the guys that other than when they landed, uh, you know, Fisher and all, and still people were like, there are some people who were like, Fisher's a guard or whatever, right? Like where are the, uh, the top tackles that they landed, right? They just didn't like, and, and I, I, that's just, he's, that's, he stand, that's Quinn. Right. And um, that's just, so it's, it's both of those guys, but it's just like, they didn't really land those guys that you would say like are slam dunks um, there. And so that's why it's like, you don't want to be in a position where it's like, well, Emil Wagner, he has to hit or else it's like, no, right? And it's, you know, obviously Emil Wagner was a high, high ranked guy who had to do physical development, but you just don't want to be in a position where it's like, well, he's got to be. And that was like the always the case. As soon as, like, no matter what, um, it, 
you know, you don't want to be in a position where you're like, you want Charles Jagasaw to play because you're like, well, he's too good not to play. Right. Not because we need someone to be the next left tackle and he's the best option. And that's yeah. like, you want, you want it to be like, you know, like a Ronnie Stanley where it's just like, well, he's going to play cause he's just the, that damn good. Right. Like, so you got to be in that kind of position and just, first of all, it's a very, it's really hard to find good offense tackles. You find them around all college football, right? It's not like everybody, like it, even if you look at say Alabama last year, and they're going to have one get J.C. Latham's going to go in the first round. And then Caden Proctor, obviously, was like, it's really hyped up. Like, those guys weren't that good last year. Like, yeah. Latham is a very good run blocker. But, like, I mean, go watch Alabama's big games and watch those guys get beat. You know, they're drinking. Mm-hmm. Like, Latham is getting drafted for the guy that he could be, not the guy he was at Alabama, right? And he was, like, a, you know, top five prospect in the entire class. So, it, it is really hard to find tackles and then for them to get at um, a high level. And I would say for so long that Notre Dame was spoiled by so many guys that they, they've had over the course of time. And they just, they just haven't been able to find enough of those tackles uh, to get in there. And it's, it's, it is also not to say that uh, whoever they have a right tackle might not end up being, really good this year, right? That that could still happen. Or that Sullivan Absher might not end up being really good. Remember, he was a guy who played in like a totally um you know like a wing T he's like yeah he was like wing T like wishbone thing. So like it's never like, true pass sets and all that stuff. Yeah. So it, it's like he's it's a process, right? So you just kind of have to look at um kind of where they're at. And also too, you're going to build your team around. If, if you don't think like these guys can win one on one, well, you better run the football darn pretty well. Right. Yeah. And you better do some different things where you're like not putting your tackles in a bad position. Right. So, um, and that is stuff that's going to get tweaked over the course of the next few months. Where, where, how was the running game on Saturday? There are a lot well, of questions about that. Like, they, they didn't run a ton, so that was a thing too. And that part of the reason they don't run a ton in those things, and it's not because you know, just like they want it to be pass up, it's like, well, you get, get more guys hurt if you run, yeah, a lot, right? So they didn't run, um, or a, a lot, so you didn't see in they weren't giving like too many carries to guys and stuff too. But I think what if they wanted to, I think they probably could have like just been like, we're gonna run it and could have kept moving the chains yeah. that way uh, for a lot of it, especially because you're not even considering the quarterback run game. Right. Yeah. And they did a little bit of it near the goal line, but not really. Um, so I'm not worried about them from that perspective. I think they're going to be mm-hmm. uh, pretty good. In that, in that as way. far as, um, you know, John Simpson asked the question, how much does Denbrock help Rudolph with the line development? And shouldn't that help as he tailors the offense uh, with skill sets he has? Absolutely. Look, this isn't Mike Dembrock's first time, right? This yeah. He's dealt with situations before where it's like, hey, maybe our offensive line isn't that great. The 2021 Cincinnati offensive line wasn't any great shakes, right? And yeah. and they were able to win games, right? They were able to beat Notre Dame and, uh, you know, Marcus Freeman. Now, granted, like, they scored 24 points in that game, so it's not like they lit him up. But what I'm saying is that, they were able to to find ways to win games. I mean, look, shoot, even uh, like Tommy Reese did it in 2021, right? They figured it out with that offensive line. They figured it out a way to to you know have a good offense, an offense that can go 11 and one. Now, granted, they beat a bunch of mediocre defenses, but still, like there are things an offensive coordinator can do. They can go more RPO game. They can spread the field, right? So you're not dealing with a bunch of heavy boxes. Um, that we saw Andrew, Audrick Estime had to run into a bunch last year. And he was like the most efficient running back running into uh, heavy boxes in college football last year. Right. Like that, that doesn't have to be the case this year. And I think that given what Notre Dame has outside, you know, in, in 2024, I think that becomes a lot more viable for Notre Dame to be able to do that. Cause you think about guys, it's like, yeah, let's get the ball outside and let them do some stuff, right. Get the ball to phase on. Get the ball to Jaden Harrison. Get the ball to Jaden Greathouse, right? Get the ball to Chris Mitchell. Like, guys like that, um, 
it, it, it just makes a lot more sense than it did even last year when numbers were low at wide receiver. They just were, right? Um, and speaking of that, I, I just feel like – I just feel like, man, that the wide receiver situation at, at this moment is so much healthier than it was a year ago. I feel like there's been a huge turnaround, Jamie. Uh, what do you see – out of that group just kind of running around on the football field. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's the thing is that they've, you know, Jane Thomas has obviously missed a good chunk of spring and phase on hasn't practiced the whole spring and Bo Collins isn't there yet. Jaden Harrison's foot, Jane Harrison's foot at the end there. So, I mean, even if you say like Jane Harrison doesn't become a guy who actually really contributes all that much, the other three guys might be, that might be three of your top five. Uh, yeah. receivers right there right and or it's probably four of your top six really right um you know maybe right so um that's a missing a lot but you just say like i think you just see i mean jay greathouse looks fantastic um and i think he's been you know benefited from all those guys being out and he's kind of they've talked about it, like i mean his ability to play in the slot but his ability to kind of move around and win matchups and you see him after the catch and all these kind of things he's like really and which is why i think he has a chance to be um an actual wide receiver one for them because he can win in a lot of different ways right so i think that's big and and i just think like you know you saw flashes from from mitchell and and kk smith which is like someone like all you want to see from kk smith and no matter what he is this year, is just like, well, this guy, this guy have a shot to be like a playmaker, and he does. You know, he he certainly does. And then when you see like Cam Williams and Micah Gilbert, Micah Gilbert had a, like a not really like a noteworthy scrimmage or anything like that. You know, he's targeted deep a few times. Like basically, only one was really on target, right? Like, uh, and it was broken up by Christian Gray, right? Uh -huh. But, but. Uh, you know, just even the fact that he's kind of out there and that they feel good enough to him for him to kind of like be above where Deion Colsey is, is a good sign, right? Like that that's right. a good sign. And they, I think that he's going to help them this year. He's going to play. Like, I don't think he's going to be necessarily like a starter, but he, he's going to play. So um, they're just in such better shape there. They're just in such better shape. And it's, it's not even to say like, I don't know that um, – even even with Great House, maybe it's premature to just say like, well, he's going to be a just a straight dude this year and be dominant. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, it might just be he's taking that next step, and then he's got to take another step the next year or something like that, right? Uh, but he's going to be good, and they have a bunch of good players that can make plays. They have more guys who can make plays, um, and I that it just wasn't a good situation at receiver the last couple of years. And they're just way, they're just way, way better there. I think KK Smith is uh we're monitoring. I mean, that's uh that's something to keep an eye on. I think he's viable. I, I think he's uh I think he's he's got something for the team. And 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 this is kind of like like when people like if someone asked the question of us about you know Cam Williams, in that like, you know, people said he, he's going to be kind of behind Micah Gilbert um, in terms of development or whatever. It, it, you don't have to, like, I think we're, we're we, when we think about this stuff, we think about defined roles. You don't have to have like a perfectly defined role as a wide receiver to make an impact. You know what I mean? Like, like Chris Brown in 2012, like this kind of a thing, like even Will Fuller in 2013, like he didn't, he didn't get a ton of snaps. But, like, he got out there maybe 10 times a game, right? He'd throw it to him deep or they'd send him on something. Like, it doesn't have to be this thing where it's like he's going to catch 50 balls. He's going to catch 30 balls, you know? It doesn't have to be that. It's just like, hey, we have a little thing for you where it's like we're going to put you in the game. We're going to we're gonna run you guys on double posts. And we think we can – like, I think they have that in K.K. Smith. And maybe Cam Williams, we'll see. But I think they have that in their bag where it's like you could just put them out there for a couple plays at a time 
the defense knowing be damned, you know, like I, I just like, that's kind of what they have. And they just didn't even have that option really last year with, with just kind of two guys who were just absolutely smoke shows and can just fly, you know? And so that's what I think they have there. And with, with phase on as well, I know Mike is super frustrated that Faison's not out there. I do not care at all. It he just is. does not yeah, matter. He, is. he, he is. does not like that. But I, I don't care. Like, truly, do whatever you want. Because I, I think he's kind of shown, like, look, I'm just a ball player. I, I, It doesn't matter to me, you know? So I think he's okay on that front. Well, I, I think whatever. It's just right now uh... – I get where Mike's coming from. I get where I he's just, coming from, but I just I just don't think it's a big deal. I just think he came in as a walk-on yeah. who zero people had zero expectations for, and then yeah. he was cooking guys in camp, and you're like, yeah, oh, okay. Well, uh, so I, I just really see no reason why he's not going to, once lacrosse is over, he's not just going to continue to, you know, be the guy that he he was right so does it hurt him a little bit um that he wasn't there for spring yeah it does for sure because maybe he would have been a guy who was like they're like oh no great house you got to move to you got to play out wide because Faison's winning the slot or whatever right and so yeah it, i mean it's gonna hurt him and he's gonna have to go and earn his spot but i just I just saw enough of him that I just think like, I don't see how he's not going to earn a role, you know? And the thing is, is like, if he is, doesn't come out and do that and doesn't earn it, then they'll just, I, then if he decides, well, I'm just going to play lacrosse for him, then that happens. But I just don't see that happening. I think he's going to still come out and be good just because some guys have it and some guys don't. And I think he's got it. Yeah, he's he's got something, right? Like like you said, like he he kind of showed, like I, he just showed up and was uh, automatically making plays. Um, yeah. And look at to Mike's point, it would be better if he was with the football program, like a hundred percent. He's not wrong. It's not a wrong take that he has. Uh, but I just think you know it, it's okay. Like Notre Dame has other options there. Um, the the, the Jaden Thomas thing drives me insane. Um, we saw it happening, like we saw it happening in real time last year. Which is the, which like you stop messing around with this guy, shut him down, wait till he's healthy. They didn't do it. They kept pressing him forward, and now he's having, you know, he's having hamstring problems again. It drives me crazy. It's just that you know what's happening in real time. I feel bad for him. I I feel terrible that he's not out there. Hopefully, he can get it sorted out. And the thing with the hamstring is, like. If you hurt it enough times, the scar tissue builds up in the muscle and the muscle never performs the way that it has again, unless you have some sort of surgery, which is not like a hundred percent either. Right? Like, so you don't, you don't want to be doing that stuff. That's why you got to take care of these things. The hamstring is, is, is a major muscle that you don't want to hurt over and over again. Yeah. I mean, to, to be fair, we don't know the extent of anything. First of all, he was doing individual. So it was like he's – it's not like he's like completely – and he's in pads and whatever. So it's not like he's completely out of there. But also, this is the other thing. It's spring, and he definitely does not need to push it right now. No, he, he does not. He definitely does not need to push it. At the same time, yes, this guy has had – he had end of camp – Beginning of the season 2022, hamstring is why he was kind of like a non-factor until like the third week or whatever, right? And then it didn't bother him the rest of the year. Never had any issues or whatever, right? But last year, it basically took away his whole season. And this guy can help the team. He's got a chance to be an NFL player. Like, he, he's – there is no one who's exactly like him. He's a different player than everyone else. So just by that, he has a different kind of value than the other receivers. Yeah. So I I really hope that he can be healthy. But, I mean, like you said, hamstring, it's a concerning thing when it's a reoccurring 
thing like that, it's very, it, it, it's very concerning. And I mean, it's just, that's the monitor. We're monitoring in a bad way. We're you monitoring know, like in a way that we don't want to be monitoring. Yeah. Um, you, you, like you said, he adds something to the to the room. He adds something to the receiving core that no one really gives them. You can play big with him on the field. You can play small with him on the field. Like he's so additive to the offense, and he allows them to just kind of be their best selves, you know. And that's what you want. Like you, you, you want the offense to have all of their kind of weapons at their disposal, and. And just be able to, you know, operate at full strength. Um, you want to operate at full strength, Jamie. Everyone wants to be their best selves. They want to maximize their performance. Uh, you want to maximize your social media page, your website, your 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 face, your your headshot for your job. You want to get a new job. You want to do that, use all, all your uh, weapons at your disposal, and you can with VSRmediacompany.com, founded by Notre Dame football pregame host and Emmy Award-winning anchor Vahid Saad Razade. VSR Media provides professional cinematic and video and photo. Whether you're looking for a collegiate or pro-level highlight reel, have a personal story to tell, or aiming to, or aiming to diversify and grow your business, VSR Media specializes in short and long form video storytelling, social media management, and website design. VSR Media also captures professional headshots, senior and sports photos. Contact them at vsrmediacompany.com. Mention Iris Sports Daily to receive 20% off your first project. Visit them online or give them a call at 574 800 9106. Now, Jamie. Can I say that the linebacking position is loaded? Can I say this? I oh, I don't know. Well, in you know good yeah, conscience, you, can I, I you, say? I can say you definitely can because the guy who complained about it before, I think he's a guy who complains about everything. So good. go for it. I just, I just want to <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah, uh, you've seen, you've been on campus, you've been around, you saw them practice. Are they loaded at linebacker in twenty twenty four, Gene? I mean, I, I think they are. I think they are, right? Like, um, I, I just wanted to just, okay, because I wrote a thing on on Kingston Villiamuasa, uh that's up on IC right now. Everybody go check it out uh, after you um, watch the podcast and listen to the podcast. But basically, so I just wanted to just, you know, lay this out. So these are just like the the, the kind of credentials for these guys. So, Jack Kaiser was the highest graded linebacker by PFF out of every linebacker that played over 300 snaps last year. So whether you want to agree with it or not, that's just what it was. Right. And he's a six year senior who's played a lot of football, who's highly productive, basically never misses any tackles and is just, you know, a guy that you want to have around because he's been three years in the system. Right. Drake Bowen, former high school Buckus award winner, uh, Jalen Steed, former five star in his third year in the in the system. Jaden Osbury, blue chip recruit, Under Armour All American, et cetera. Kingston, you know, K KVA, uh, you know, also a high school Buckus Award winner, LA Times uh, Player of the Year, you know, Defensive Player of the Year, Trinity League, blah blah blah, whatever, right? Like, um, so just by pedigree. These guys are it's it's a loaded room that they're there. I mean, Notre Dame has had a lot of talent. Um, you know, th they've had a lot of talent at linebacker before. I'm not saying that's never happened, but that number of like if those are like and those are the top five guys right now, like those are pretty impressive, like credentials just going into it, right? Um, and there's a reason why all these guys might play. It's not because they can't figure out. You know, they can't figure out who's good enough to start. It's like, well, these guys are all good. We got to find ways. It's like Osbury, they're, they're like trying to find ways to get him on the field, right? Yeah. KVA, it's a freshman linebacker. Like, no one wants to play a freshman linebacker, right? Like, there are only 11 in all of Power 5 who are true freshmen who played 300-plus snaps last year. And some of those guys played out of necessity because they didn't have anybody else. You know, like some guys were just studs. So probably about half the guys, like five or six guys were just studs. 
And the other guys were kind of like Niles Morgan in, in 2014, where they were like, uh, you have to play because we started a former walk on and he's hurt now and you got to go in because we got nobody else. Right. Even though he wasn't ready to play and didn't really play much the next year. So that's not the case with KVA. He is like one of those five, six, you know, he is one of those guys and everything I've heard about him and everything. And obviously just seeing him too, like he is legit. He is going to be a big time player, but like Bowen is out there making plays uh, you know what you already got in Kaiser. Sneed is out there, like flying around, like just playing under control, but still fast and violent, you know, but under control. And, you know, they, they they've talked about like Max Bullet talked about, he flipped the switch, like things have clicked for him now, right? Um, so you have all of that there. That's pretty loaded. Like that's pretty loaded because normally you don't have five guys who can play like literally in 2018, they had two. It was, you know, it was just tranquil. Well, maybe three really. Right. Cause I mean, Bilal yeah. played at Rover and he can play, but I mean, there was a drop off between for sure. For sure. You know, there's, there was tranquil and Coney were like a level above. And I'm not saying that all these guys are going to be like, man, one of these guys is going to be Coney and one of these guys can be tranquil or e e even, um, you know, that it's going to be like one of these guys is, is JOK this year or KO or, or Smith. It's not necessarily happening that way, but they have a bunch of guys who could play at all good options. And then the cream is just going to rise to the top. So they're going to be good this year at linebacker. They're just fast, athletic. They have a really good coach in Bulla. Um, you know, when people are talking about the defense going to be elite, you wouldn't be talking about it if the linebackers weren't looking that impressive. Yeah. Because easily it could have been a situation where, you know, how we're talking about right tackle. Well, we don't know who's going to be that. That's not been the case. So, yes, stock up in the linebackers. They're loaded. Because I would even say Zinter and – um Kia like those guys flashed and obviously like they're you know like they're down there and they're not really like kind of in the mix they're not getting the work in with the ones or anything like that but it's like those guys they don't look like schleps like they look like they can play like so there's reason to be excited about them going forward right so it's like I just think they are in a really good spot at at linebacker right now and um, it's like, they're just in that kind of situation where it's just a good problem to have. The other thing is like, they've got a ton of dudes there. Max Bull is a star. He, I, I watched those videos they put out and there's a couple of things that Matt posted on the board about him doing the coach clinic stuff. He, he's a star. It, truly. I mean, I just the way that he caught, like, I know, because you have to also understand the personality of that position, right? Like, he, it, it, I, I say that knowing, like, he's not coaching the corners. He's not coaching safeties. The, the way that he coaches that specific position and the energy that he brings and the way that he brings them along rep to rep, these guys, they're going to be awesome. Like, I, I am so confident in that. All of them, like KVA, Sneed, uh, uh, Bowen and Osbeck, like they're gonna hit man with this guy teaching them. He just knows how to get to these guys, he knows how to communicate with them. What what a coup for Notre Dame landing him! I mean, truly, like, it, like uh, Laurenitis when he left, a lot of people were bummed. And it's one of those things, it's like, man, it you felt like he was, I don't want to say a rising star or whatever, but people liked him a lot. He was a good recruiter, right. And I think a part of it, too, was like they're going to lose KVA because of Laurinaitis, right? That was another part of it. It's like they're going to get they're going to get done up in recruiting because they lost this guy. You get Max Bullitt to come in, right, from Bama. What a coup. What just an absolute star that he is coaching that position. Can't wait to see how that, that, that group kind of uh, – you know, progresses and develops because man, I, I just, I really see it with him. Uh, he, so he's good. Um, 
I dude, watched the like, full uh, 45 minutes, by the way, of that. Um, Cause I actually uh, like, there's a, I, more stuff at the clinic that I wanted to watch and I knew Bull was going to talk at it. So it's yeah. like a one you can watch or, or through, through zoom or whatever. So yeah. I watched his full talk, like prior to all this stuff getting on, on YouTube and yeah, yeah. Like the whole thing is great. He's, he's very impressive. And he's just, you could just see him around and everything I've heard about him. And I'll just say yeah. too, like, I've heard great things about Laurenitis as well, but like, and he is also, I think, too, personality wise, you kind of need a guy who's like got the volume turned up and he's just like, go. And he's got, he's that guy. And I think he's a good fit on the staff because of that. Just cares. A hundred, like, 100% genuinely cares. And that's just like, it, it means the world to players. It truly does. Um, D line, are you concerned about depth inside, Jamie? Obviously, there's Cross and Mills. Are you concerned? I, I, I feel like there's a lot of eggs in the Rubio basket right now. And, uh, you know, the, like a lot of eggs in the Rubio, Anye. Got like, you got to be good. I can't, you can't just give us like 10, 15 snaps. You got to be good players. Got to be real good. Like 25, 25 snaps a game, like quality. Like, are you concerned about that at all? I mean, not no. just. Why? Not, was, not at I, all. Did, no, did I did, did any of my practice sports make it look? No, like no, 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 no. I'm 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 like if something happens to like Cross or Mills, I mean it's uh, a big deal. Whatever, obviously you for lose sure. a guy who's great. It's a big deal, but I mean you could say that for X Watts or whatever. Like it's you could say that for anything, right? Like fair. some guys who are just elite guys are elite guys, and it's going to be tough to replace them. But I mean, in terms of like. If uh, and obviously Rubio, we'll see what happens when he comes back. But he played at a at a high level last year with the snaps. He played at a high level. Um, Donovan Heinish is a good player. Like he's just small. It, that is the only thing. He is just if he was his brother size, people would be talking about him different. But also too, as a guy that he. Doesn't have if, if he has to play, you know, 15 plays a game, he's gonna be pretty good for those plays. And Anya is better than he was last year, and he was already kind of on the rise last year. I think they're totally fine. They're top five D tackles. Like it's probably the the fact that they even have five guys who can play, like that hasn't always been the case. A lot of years they've had three, right? And and you know, and it's been a steep, steep drop off to the fourth or whatever right where it's not like that it's you know it's certainly i i mean mills and cross are at a different level than uh and, and that's just the way it is when you know your guys who they could they be drafted you know in the nfl this year if they went so um that's like a it, it's hard to just say because there's always going to be some kind of drop off uh but i i don't know i i mean future wise I mean, the fact that I would say, like, you know, Brandon Vernon not didn't really see much of him, and then Houston didn't get that many reps. Him and Houston didn't get many many reps in the thing, and they were like, I mean, Mullins and Seviano got more reps than those guys in the scrimmage. Um, and I will say those guys, I thought for freshmen, uh, saw some good things from from both of those two there. But you know, it's not good that those other guys aren't there, and obviously Mookum's hurt too, but. Um, you'd want to see more from these guys going in their second spring. You'd want like, you know, of course you would have wanted Tyson Ford to be not like probably likely on his way out or whatever, going somewhere else or whatever. But like you'd, you'd want him to be in the mix there, but he's never really gone into the mix. But I mean, as far as where they're at for this year, like I'm not, I think they're in very good shape there. Oh, okay. All right. Well, good then. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll mark that off as something that I'm not monitoring for, for going forward. Uh, defensive ends. You, you like very good about, very good about uh, the edge. Like I said in the last show, Notre Dame pass rush this year. Um, that should not be any problem, you know, just from the defensive end position. I'm not going to say they're like, you know, they're going to be like world beaters or anything. They should be strong in that area. There was a question earlier that I wanted to get to that I was saving from Trevor uh, Mackey about or Trevor McKee, excuse me, uh, about uh, the the difference between Viper 
and Big End. And like kind of, if you could give people a kind of a refresher about who's playing each position there. Okay, so um, Botello starts at uh, Viper yeah. uh, for Notre Dame. And um, Oban is is the big end. And you'll see, like, it's Oban and Burnham over at uh, big end. And it's uh, Traore uh, you know, along with Botello and Junior Tuihalmaka at Viper. And I would say the big difference is, I mean, you kind of want that um, the big end to be a bit uh, bigger, right? To be a bit that guy is typically, pun intended. Yeah, and you 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 mm-hmm. t- you typically want to have uh, that that guy's going to have his hand in the ground a lot yeah. more. That um, the the viper is more of like a two point stand stand up edge, uh, so that's like you know one of the. Uh, you know, the big difference is sometimes that guy's going to drop to the flat, uh, you know, be a coverage player. Um, that big end is basically, unless they have some kind of like, you know, like zone pressure call that they're dropping, like very rarely, like maybe once or twice a year or something, you might see that even then maybe zero, right? Like you're not going to see that very much. So where the other guy would, you know, the Viper would be more involved in, in coverage right yeah. like definitely like oh 90 percent of the time that guy's rushing but 10 <clears throat> percent of the time you might say well this guy might might man up a tight end or have a back in the flat or mm-hmm. whatever right so there's that part of it um i think in general just like the big thing is that um it's not like a it's not so to call it a rush end versus a regular defensive end, that's not the way to kind of do it. Because like I said, that guy drops in the coverage, but that guy's just a little bit more athletic, a little bit more fluid. Um, <clears throat> going to play um, against the tight end a little bit more, right? Rather than a tackle. So that's part of it too. Okay. All right. And we're, we're feeling good about that position. Uh the the Adon Schuler stuff continue to uh to, to like what we're hearing on that front. Uh Luke Talich. Um what did you see from Talich on, on Saturday in terms of movement, in terms of uh you know getting in and out of breaks, things of that nature? Uh he looks good getting in and out of breaks, and certainly like I mean, always when there's a guy that size, you're always comparing him to Kyle Hamilton, just size wise, right? Yeah, you're comparing mm-hmm. him from that, and which I always think is unfair because there are just not many guys like you can go back and look at like that. Um, there's a clip from the combine where uh, you know Kyle's ha- having to open up his hips and, and go, and you're just like this is not human how a guy that tall is, 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 is able to kind of flip his hips and go like that. And he's not there, but he's certainly not stiff. He's not stiff. And I I think that is one thing. I I mean, I I would say like, it's like basically a thousand percent. If you see a safety right away, just when you're talking about seeing them live in a person and you see a guy who's like tight, Mm -hmm. got stiff hips, at least at Notre Dame, those guys are over. None of those guys have ever become players, right? Yeah. And so that's what I would say, like about him, and I would say about Kennedy Urlacher too. Like Kennedy Urlacher, a lot more fluid than I thought he was, and and could run. He could run and open up and play the deep half and do some of that stuff that I didn't think. Where maybe he's only a box guy, and he certainly is a very aggressive downhill player. Um, but yeah, he's you know not just. He, he, he doesn't have to be just put into that category. I think he can be a little bit more because that was what I was worried about Kennedy Urlacher because there's so much of him just basically being like this guy who plays in the middle of the field and just comes downhill and plays. Because yeah. you know, it, it, to be fair to him, like, why are you playing him as a single high safety? This is stupid coach of his team. Like, don't do that. Like, maybe they didn't have anybody else, but maybe don't play single high. Like, it just wasn't yeah. doing them him any favors. But um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, Talich also had uh, a sack on a blitz in the game too. So uh, that's always nice to see. Um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, it, you're not looking to those guys to be – you're not looking at him to have a big role. This could, could he be Ramon Henderson? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think easily. Like like next year, like in 24. I don't think he'll – I just think they'll, they'll be heard and – Yeah, like, like, um, I'm, I'm, like I'm just saying like – If he had to play? If he had to, yeah. There's a shot. I don't know. Like, I, I still need to see more of him, I think. I think okay. I would say, like, I – because uh, the other thing is, is that, like, you just – it's so hard in some of these things, too, when um, when it's just, like, bang, bang with some of the stuff and you don't see them, like uh, – like, you're only noticing a safety when it's, like, oh, I mean, he got beat or this. Yeah, like, like he's chasing he's or something. Up. So it's, like yeah. – so. Yeah. I would say like safety is easily for me when I'm just watching it off the top, especially because I'm trying to look at the line and stuff like that. You're really only seeing so much when they're only like involved in the play and kind mm -hmm. of uh, where they're at. So that's tough for me to judge, but certainly how he moves and just kind of him being around the football. Also like, you know, I mentioned last week too, that like, you know, he had like a, like the biggest hit of the day in the previous scrimmage that they had too. So, I mean, when someone's just showing up like that, that's always a good sign. It's a good sign. And it just kind of shows like, like if they're sending him on blitzes and stuff and then he's getting home and then they just keep to continue like to build that trust in him. He's going to, I think he's going to be a player. I do. I, I, I think, I think Notre Dame's going to go into the season with four safeties that can play. Um, obviously Watson and Hurd will be the starters, but I think uh, Schuler, he's going to play. I think Talich is going to play. I, I think they've got a good situation, and I think it really helps for um, 25 as well, just like knowing you've got some guys in the back pocket who you can put out there and, and can play. So um, that's that's good to hear. You know, to be honest, Jamie, this should be a good football team. It should. There's There's no reason to believe beyond the offensive line – that they're just not going to be really good. That all all of the all of the signs are there. All of the things that you want are, are there. You're going to have a good pass rush. You're great in the secondary, right? You got Ben Morris in there. You've got Xavier Watts there. You've got Christian Gray there, who's he's going to be really good. Um, you've got your linebackers, right? Who are young and youthful and just can run. Like you don't have to get slower putting linebackers on the field. It's just, it just, they should be really good. They should be really good. And, and I think, I don't think the offensive line should be the reason that this team isn't like a good, good team. They don't have to be great, but I think you just have enough between Denbrock and the quarterback uh, with Riley Leonard, the way he can run the wide receivers, the running backs, the tight ends. I think Cooper Flanagan's good. I think Cooper Flanagan's a good player, Jamie. I like He's him. a good player for sure. He's a good player. Eli um, Reardon's a good player. Mitchell Evans. I, I just, I just, they, they should be good. There's no reason they won't be really, really good. Yeah, and I, and I think you know when you're talking about, I mean, on defense, it's like lock it down. They're going to be great. Like it's just, you know, I don't think it, it's it's not high. First of all, they were great last year, so and they you know they're returning great players. You know, the, the guys that I have returning are great players. So that helps. And But, you know, they have a lot of young guys that are kind of ready to kind of be the next great guys and develop into that, too. So I think that's part of it. And I, and I just think when you're talking about like. Um, OK, so you were kind of worried about like the, the depth of defensive tackle, like like there or like, you know, maybe like the fourth defensive tackle or like. I, I would say the thing that I would be worried about the most is like, who's the backup nickel? Who's the fourth corner? Right. I mean, you know how many years that Notre Dame had no nickel? <laughs> like that was like a fake and they still played pretty good defense when they were like having to play a guy who really wasn't really a nickel. By the way, had. by the way, I'm not worried about backup nickel at all. Cause they'll just have Rod Hurd do it and put it. Yeah, for sure. I know that's what like, I mean. Like, like, but that's, like, yeah, that's the kind of thing though, that you're like, coming out of this because um of course you know because it's not always everybody always wants uh it to be you know lollipops and, and uh ice cream 
everything's perfect, but it isn't always because, you know, we're not hyping up Micah Bell out of this. And yeah. that would have been great if, if, you know, we could have been like, man, Micah Bell looks like he should get in the mix there. But it's like, no, nah, he doesn't really look like that yet. So, or maybe he won't ever. I don't know. So um, that's something to to watch and all that. And, but really like, uh, it's a lot of, there's a lot more like champagne problems for, for, for this sure. team in, in general. And I think that's a credit to, um, you know, the staff and how they've developed, how they've recruited. Um, and it's, it's not to say they don't need certain things to happen for them to really be like a true contender. And obviously like you can still be a really good football team and you could lose games that you're not supposed to lose and all that kind of stuff. Right. So yep. we, we got to wait and see, but all you can ask for is having that team in place where you're like, man, you know, we should be in a position to win every game. And I really do think that um, they have a team that's good enough for that. And to come out of spring feeling like that, I think that should be um, something that Notre Dame fans should be excited about. Yep. We're going to leave it there. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please hit the like, please hit subscribe, please hit the notification bell. So you know whatever it is, we are going live. We'll be back Thursday to preview the blue and gold scrimmage. Uh, I believe they're going to have their draft that day. Uh, so we'll talk about the teams and and what we're looking to see and everything. And we're all going to get eyes on the team. Uh, there, there may be portal stuff by that point. Who knows? Um, we'll check that out. We'll talk about all those things. Uh, are you around? Jamie, we can do a live show th uh, Saturday after the. Uh, it's TBD because uh, I might not have childcare, so that's we're monitoring. Well, look, okay, I'll I'll try to do something because uh, I th there are games that I have to or I'd like to attend, but maybe not. I, mean, I we do have a show that we need to we need to do stuff. So maybe I'll get Mike on or something, or maybe I'll just do a solo show. We'll talk about it. Whatever we got to do, do it for the people. So, but stay tuned for that. So stay locked into us. We'll be back Thursday. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Keep hitting and hustling.